Welcome to At Home and Abroad with Harrison Walker. Join us each week as we follow our curiosity, diving deep into the familiar and the foreign. Reach beyond your front door as we uncover new perspectives, explore intriguing ideas, and have real conversations with the best guests. Ready for something different? Let's get started. Oh, Harris, we are in dangerous territory today. We sure (laughs) are, Walker. So do you believe in the power of curses and hexes? Well, you know, I'm actually not sure. There have been so many compelling stories over the years, and I kind of do believe Mm -hmm. in the power of negative intention. You know, when somebody really doesn't like you, (laughs) there's some power behind that. Like if they're jealous or wishing you malintent. I don't know. What do you think? Well, none of that here right now. Oh, definitely not. (laughs) Definitely not. Well, generally speaking, I'd say that I don't think people have the ability to wield that sort of power over others. But I'd be lying if I said that I 100% am convinced that curses don't exist. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe I've watched way too many Indiana Jones movies and too many 1970s sitcoms. Oh my God, I'm right there with you. Scooby-Doo was truly a formative show in my life. Well, we may be dating ourselves, Harris, but we were set up from an early age to be on the lookout for curses, weren't we? Yeah, because they made for the best stories. And of course, the ever popular Harry Potter series just drove at home. So have you ever had a curse put on you? I hope not. (laughs) Not that I know of, Walker. Is this when you're going to tell me that you have? Well, not me personally, but during my first trip to Rome, a little old lady approached my friend and I and asked her specifically for money. When my friend told her that she had no cash on her, this little old lady came up to her and shouted, May you and your children be forever cursed. Oh my gosh, I'd be terrified. Did it shake you guys up? Uh, Yeah, certainly in the moment. Yeah, so did anything happen? Did your friend experience anything negative after that old lady cursed her? (laughs) Well, luckily not. We tore out of there. You know, she was little, but she looked like she could deliver some pretty serious bad vibes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm glad you guys dodged it. We're pretty lucky today though, Walker. Our next guest is Dr. Philip Stevens, Jr. Dr. Stevens is a cultural anthropologist and professor emeritus at the University at Buffalo. His research analyzes and traces the roots of religion and spiritualism in human culture, and he lends his expertise to our understanding of curses, magic, sorcery, and witchcraft. Welcome to At Home and Abroad, Dr. Stevens. Thank you very much, and please call me Phil. Okay. So I think a good place for us to start, Phil is your recent book, Rethinking the Anthropology of Magic and Witchcraft, Inherently Human, in which you explore the idea that magic and magical thinking are inherent within our psychology and even perhaps rooted in our evolutionary biology. So can you expand on this really interesting idea for us? Sure. The book is uh, about magic and witchcraft. So for this conversation, we will just talk about magic, the topic of curse fits under that category. So the purpose of my book was actually threefold. First, uh, scholars in all disciplines have have talked about magic, but have never, never agreed on a definition. Uh, And even within anthropology, there has not been an, an accepted definition of what we mean when we talk about magic or magical thinking. Uh, And so I want to uh, uh, set down a definition based on the most common uses of the term in anthropology. And second, um, it is assumed by by scholars who use the word that that the reaction to or the belief in the the concept is is, uh, understood. in fact, it is not. Uh, a second purpose of my book is to is to try to show how uh, people who are targets of of magic or who use magic, what what they think is is going on, how how they think the cosmos is is working uh, for or uh, against them. Uh, this is really a fundamental premise of anthropology to get inside the uh, the minds and the rationale of 
people themselves and not to assume that we know uh, better or that our definition is is the right one. But the third aim is expressed in my subtitle, Inherently Human. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, when I got interested in these these topics, um, it began to occur to me that certain aspects of magical thinking are absolutely universal, found in all cultures with no exceptions at all, and in all periods of recorded history as well. That fact of a cultural universal suggests that there's something fundamentally human going on here. Right. Uh, and so that was my first premise. And a lot of scholars have proposed this in, in past decades, but uh, in my book, I have found clinical evidence to support it. I've divided up the, the concept of magic into six different components, I will call them. Uh, and I examine each one looking for neurobiological data, uh, clinical data that supports my argument that these components of magical thinking are fundamental to human thinking. This, this is the way people think. This is the way they construct their world and the way they uh, assume systems of cause and effect in the cosmos. The important thing is um, in the anthropological definition of magic, we're talking about assumed forces in nature. Um, religion and religious uh, ritual all deal with spiritual beings. A belief in spirits is also absolutely universal. But magic presumes that people and things in nature can act on one another without spiritual assistance. Uh, and in all magical rituals everywhere, words are important. And curse is the use of words uh, in a negative way uh, to try to cause something harmful to happen to uh, someone else. I find that fascinating that, first of all, that magical thinking is ubiquitous for all humans across the planet. And could we say that curses are as well? Is that something that is fundamental to, to human culture as well? Let, let me start with the, the basic facts here. Language is universal. Right. A lot has been made of language as a distinguishing human characteristic. Language is the vehicle of culture. Language is the means of, of human communication. Right. Everywhere, everywhere, with no exception, Language is regulated. Uh, there are two ways in which people can speak to one another uh, in a beneficent way or in a negative, harmful way. The beneficent way is blessing. Uh, have a nice day, we say. And that's everybody likes to hear that. That's fine. And there is universally the belief that spoken words can and do make things happen in the world by themselves. Yeah, they have power. We can call on God to do something for us. So if I say, God bless you, that's we would call invocation. I'm in, invoking God to do that nice thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the other hand, if I were to say, God damn you, which is a direct violation of one of God's uh, fundamental commandments to to people, um, I am asking God to do this horrible thing to someone else. Right. But if I say, go to hell, I am not invoking any spiritual agency. I am using my own words to somehow shape the destiny of the person I'm speaking to. And this sounds simplistic, but in fact, people everywhere believe that words have power the power of their own meaning to make things happen. And consequently, speech is regulated everywhere. And in many cultures, curse, the negative use of, of words, uh, is um, punishable. Right. And so, so too is it uh, in, uh, in the West. Uh, we have libel and slander laws. Uh, 
uh, to libel someone uh, uh, in uh, in print or to slander someone uh, in in uh, in speech. So curse is the use of words to to make uh, something negative happen to someone else. The meaning of curse is used kind of loosely. And in the long run, it may not really matter, but it, it's frequently confused with two other concepts or believed practices that can make similar things happen. Hex. Hex is a word for a, a negative spell. Okay. Which may involve words and and does indeed involve uh, rituals, and this is the kind of thing a witch or or a sorcerer uh, uh, does. The other is jinx. Okay. And this word implies that things in the cosmos, that net, that that network of energy in the cosmos that connects everything is somehow out of whack. And for for cosmic reasons, you're not doing well. You're su- suffering a series of misfortunes or, or lack of success in something. And th- this is not necessarily caused by another person. So those, those are the three terms that are s- sometimes used interchangeably. But curse technically is is speech. It it involves words. People believe that their words go into the cosmos in whatever language they are spoken, and they make things happen in the cosmos. And if it's a a pleasant thing, have a nice day, uh, hope you do well, that kind of thing, then there's no uh, intervening. But if it's negative, a curse and must be somehow counteracted or nullified or withdrawn. And so remedies for curse are a more powerful curse, which people believe uh, may counteract the the words that the cursor used, uh, or somehow forcing the utterer to withdraw, to apologize, um, or some kind of ritual magic, like uh, an amulet, a magical item frequently worn on the body. Right. Uh, vulnerable people, sick people, uh, the very young and the very old, in many cultures, will wear some kinds of charms. Uh, they may use religious objects because they have power. Uh, like the cross or the star of David or uh, the crescent and star and and, uh, and so on, on a necklace over their heart, perhaps, or uh, on around their waist or on a bracelet or something. And these are viewed sort of as protective talismans to prevent curses, but they're also, I would assume, are to remedy a curse that may have already been implemented. Yeah, could that be true too? Yeah, absolutely. So there are two distinct things going on here. Um, we have to understand the concept of power, uh, supernatural power, mystical power, which is the essence of religious belief. Um, the difference between holy water and ordinary water is the holy water has sacred power in it. You can't feel it, you can't see it, you can't smell it, but it, it's it's conceptual and. Things from uh, religion can be used magically, uh, and people use the Christian cross in in magical ways, or throughout history, relics of saints and mm-hmm. uh, and and so on. Uh, things that have been in contact with something specially holy can uh, extract some of the power, and people can use it them uh, themselves as an amulet. And simply having that power on the person might be, we hope, enough to deflect, not prevent a curse, but to deflect it to, or, or somehow somehow nullify it. Yeah. And we still see these amulets and talismans in modern day. I'm thinking of, you know, the evil eye in Turkey and, and in Greece. Let me interrupt you here. The mm-hmm. evil eye is a different concept. Okay. 
the evil eye is a belief almost identical to witchcraft. Oh. Um, it is a belief in a power in certain individuals which enables them to project active evil through the through the gaze. You don't need speech. Right. Okay. Defenses against the evil eye are are you're right on. You're they're they're similar. Uh, the evil eye is is located around the Mediterranean and the Middle East, uh, and it's spread from those areas uh, through colonization and from the 17th century on into uh, other areas in Europe and and uh, the New World, but. It's not curse. It's a it's a belief in a mystical power in certain people, and that's what rich, witchcraft is in the anthropological sense too. But we we won't we won't go there. We'll have to go there next time. Excellent. We'll have to go there I, next time. I absolutely. can't wait. This is fascinating. I, I would love to do that because the the concept of witchcraft is even far more confused and and far more varied than than magic. It's very nuanced. I don't think many people realize how nuanced these terms are, but it's becoming clearer. I do have a question in that line, though. Is it a gray area when we consider superstition? How does superstition work hand in hand with the belief in curses and hexes? Excellent, excellent question. And we tend to dismiss people who who display these beliefs by the word superstition or superstitious. I advised uh, my students to be very wary of using this word. It implies a, uh, a sense of falsity and a sense that you, the user of the term, have a better explanation. And that's implicit in the Latin roots of the word. Super means above or superior. Stitio means a standing point, comes from the Latin word sto stare, to stand. Uh, and, and it means I, I, I hear your explanation, but it, it really is weak. Uh, uh, and uh, we know that there's a better one. It's a put down. It's a condescending term. And that, yes, uh, people don't realize that. And uh, uh, so they want to be careful because magical beliefs are absolutely universal, and my book argues that they are natural. Mm -hmm. It is logical that people think this way. Magic depends on two fundamental principles, similarity and contact. Things that are somehow like other things have a causal relationship with those other things. Uh, and this is absolutely basic. There's some evidence in the brain studies, especially in the investigation of the so-called mirror neurons that, that support my contention that this is rooted in our cognitive capacity. Uh, things that have been in contact with other things uh, have a powerful connection even after they are separated. And those are two of the fundamental principles of, of magical thinking. They're absolutely universal. At all levels of society, they have nothing to do with education or economic background or or uh, class or anything else. Your book does speak about the fact that this could be this magical thinking could be rooted in our evolutionary biology. Yes. So, is there some sort of protective function that it had as humans developed over time? That's my assumption when I when I make that statement some kind of maybe protective but definitely advantageous some aspect of behavior which becomes an aspect of thinking that somehow benefits the individuals or the groups uh, that use it mm -hmm. and um it gets it gets complicated. We need more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot more time. We need a lot more time. So if it is inherent to all human thinking, obviously curses cross cultural boundaries. This is deeper than culture. Yeah. Um, this is rooted in our our evolutionary neurobiology. It it yeah. is the it is the the way people think. Yeah, it's fascinating. So Curses, 
are featured very often in fairy tales and, you know, tales of lore gone by, ancient texts, even right. religious texts. Right. Are there modern day examples that you could perhaps provide us or is it a is it getting lost to the mists of time? Is it becoming a forgotten practice? Excellent, excellent question. And the answer is no, it is still, it is still current. Um, one aspect of the of belief in the power of words is about the staying power of, of words so that a curse uttered generations or, or eons ago might still be in effect today. It has never been countered. It has never been withdrawn. It has never been dissolved by a, a more powerful ritual or, or so on. And that really is the essence of some of the f- famous beliefs in, in curses like the Hope Diamond or, or uh, Tutankhamun, the, 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 the boy king, the, the Bermuda Triangle, thing, things like that. I just happened to be reading the, the New York Times last Friday, June 21st, uh, in the arts section, a film review by Alyssa Wilkinson, who is reviewing a horror movie, The Exorcism. Oh, right. She says that people believe uh, that movie sets can generate their own kind of of dangerous uh, mystical power by dabbling in occult things, especially things having to do with the devil, uh, things having to do with demons and and mm-hmm. so on. And she gives several examples. Uh, in Hollywood, people recognize this. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's it's uh, bad business to fool around with the, with the devil. Black culture of, of the South had uh, had similar beliefs. There was a, a popular uh, belief that you got to accommodate the devil because he's always there, but be very wary. Feed the devil, it, is, it says, but with a long spoon. Let me uh, throw in something, a, a challenging thought here. I also have written on conspiracy theories, and there's, a, there's an important similarity between this topic of curse and beliefs in curses uh, and beliefs in conspiracies. Uh, wow. These these uh, evil uh, powers out there somewhere formulated and carried on by by people. That's a fascinating link. These are not only current, but in many instances, they seem to be intensifying. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I can see that. Well, Phil, there are some famous and familiar family curses that have fascinated society, like the Kennedy family curse, the Rockefellers or the Guinness family. I'm just wondering, how can we explain these generational curses that result in so much misfortune? Yeah, I've thought about that question, and uh, it seems to me at least two two fundamental things are going on here. First of all, uh, celebrity families are in the limelight. They're in focus. Their actions are the topic of of daily uh, news coverage. They're being scrutinized. Uh, if you look at them carefully, you'll find that many of these alleged successions of family tragedies associated with something, maybe just the family name, are in fact no more numerous than happens with other families who who are not well known. And the other aspect of it is that celebrity families tend to take risks more than mm. others. They tend to get into these uh, um, dangerous uh, situations, perhaps uh, racing cars or, or drugs or, you know, and people should look at the histories of these famous families and their infamous uh, curses and see whether there really are uh, such a, a unusual series of, of unfortunate events which, which have no other explanations. I find that really interesting because when we think about the Kennedys or we think about the Onassis family, it's almost like we're waiting for the next major headline. Then we're like, oh my gosh, there it is. You know, another terrible thing has happened to this family. Believing that one is the victim of a curse could be quite terrifying. If I thought that somebody had cursed me, what does one do after the fact? What's the next step? I frequently, believe it or not, maybe not frequently, uh, Perhaps every other month, I get a call from people who have found me on the internet and and who want help removing 
uh, what they believe is is a curse or uh, or some kind of a of a hex. We are talking here now about the placebo effect, okay. the power of belief. If people are devout Catholics, uh, which I might find out through my interview, I will refer them to their their priest. Otherwise, I might refer them to a psychologist. If if people are convinced that they are the victims of some kind of curse, and they may even have a mechanism in mind, uh, they know who did it, and they know why, and they know when it happened. We then become witch doctors, mm-hmm. uh, and I have played that role uh, many many times, really, to try to convince the believer either that that person could not really have done this or he or she was not versed in the occult uh, that it was a it was really weak and it surely has dissolved by now simply by age or we could go the route of establishing some kind of ritual that dissolves the the curse you might remember the story of uh, Billy uh, Cianus, uh, William Cianus, who owned the Billy Goat Tavern across the street from uh, Wrigley Field, 1930, 1940s, the famous or infamous Curse of the Billy Goat, remember? I don't think I've heard that one, actually. The Curse of the Billy Goat. Well, sports world is filled with these kinds of e- e- examples. They are. And uh, he brought his his goat, his pet goat. Now, the billy goat is not the cute little thing you find in a petting zoo, right? <laughs> the the billy goat is the uncastrated adult male. Uh, he's not pleasant. He's aggressive and uh, he's uh, irritable and he stinks, you know? <laughs> Um, if it wasn't bad already. <laughs> and he brought he brought this goat into the and he was asked to remove the goat. And um this was the second game of the World Series. And and he said, Okay, these Cubs aren't gonna win another game or another <laughs> series or something. Uh he said something. Okay. So the generations went came and went, and the Cubs never got back to the World Series again. And the curse of the Billy Goat was hanging over the team, and they went to many different methods to try to dissolve it: blowing up a baseball, uh, shooting a, a baseball with a shotgun, or something that made it explode into smithereens. All kinds of of rituals. Finally, was it just a a few years ago, 2016, the Cubs a- actually won, remember? And yeah. the curse of the billy goat was, was dissolved. So people believe that there is a ritual that can dissolve the curse. Uh, and if it doesn't work, it's just that you got the wrong ritual or you're not doing it right. Right. Um, in many cultures, if people know how a curse was placed, they can reverse the mechanism, it recite something backwards or move through the ritual backwards. I spent many years in in Nigeria. In the Peace Corps, am I correct? First with the Peace Corps and then later for anthropological research. And and uh, I, I saw a lot and, and learned a lot from there that shaped my beliefs and actually the foundation for, for my book. I tell the story of how a boy in our school where I was teaching um, performed an act of sorcery against a visiting table tennis team. And um, both schools uh, were were terrified and ran after the boy as if to kill him. Oh, gosh. And that, that really was, I was young, naive, 21 or 22 years old, teaching in this uh, school in Nigeria. And this event happened and prompted me to look into this kind of belief system. So working within the belief system to somehow alleviate the the immediate stress is this is witch doctoring. This is what a witch doctor does within the culture of the of, of the people who who believe. And then later you can work on the belief system and say, look, really this this defies all known laws of physics. Uh, 
the world just does not work this way. There's absolutely no evidence anywhere, no matter what you are told, that people can use words to to make things happen, etc., etc., etc. But stay away from that line of argument during the crisis, uh, while the person is suffering from this belief. Well, we're definitely going to have to have you back again to talk about witchcraft. I can't wait. I could talk about this forever. I'd like to thank you for joining us here today, Phil. If you'd like to learn more about Dr. Stevens, he's published widely on the subject. Perhaps most notably is his book, Rethinking the Anthropology of Magic and Witchcraft, Inherently Human, published just last year. Thank you so much, Phil. You're very welcome. It's been a pleasure. The next time somebody wishes me a good day, I'm going to think of this little chat we just had. Oh, I was thinking the exact same thing. He really made sense of it all. And it's so interesting to think that this is a human belief, not just a cultural one. Right. It's not surprising that the idea of curses still holds such sway with us, Walker. And of course, we love the mystery of it all. We do love to be scared, don't we? We do. And for good reason, too. According to the Montreal Science Center, fear pumps our body full of hormones like adrenaline, dopamine, and endorphins. And these are all designed to help our bodies react and move very quickly in the face of fear, but they also offer us a sense of power and calm. Okay, but it's one thing to enjoy the thrill and storytelling aspect of a curse than to really believe that you're the victim of one, right? Yeah, for sure. That would not be enjoyable at (laughs) all. It's still a modern day belief among some, though I can't imagine that people are dishing out curses these days for people's crops to fail or livestock to die. I don't think that's happening. Yeah, probably not. A curse today would be more like along the lines of, I hope your favorite Netflix series buffers until next year. (laughs) (laughs) That would be a true curse. (laughs) Or your Wi-Fi's down. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Or your Wi-Fi's down. Or for me, it would be being condemned to the self-checkout line for like the rest of my life. I hate those. Not the best fodder for the legendary curses like days of old. Right. Like Phil's example of the Chicago Cubs billy goat curse. Yeah, exactly. One legendary curse that sticks out in my mind, though, was the Hope Diamond. Oh, right. So what are the details of that one again? Well, apparently a French gem merchant named Jean-Baptiste Tavernier procured this beautiful and large blue diamond in the 1660s while traveling in India. He kept his cards close to his chest on how he obtained it, but some think the curse began because he plucked it from a Hindu goddess. Ooh, so how large is large? Oh, it's large, (laughs) Walker, it's large. Originally in its uncut form, it is believed to have been 116 carats before it was presented and sold to King Louis XIV. His jeweler had it cut and set, and it acquired the name French Blue around this time. It remained in the royal family for some time before it was seized in that fateful year of 1792. You know, the French Revolution and beheadings and all that. And it then made its way to London, It's thought to have been recut again then. By 1839, it was eventually bought by London-based Dutch collector Henry Philip Hope. Today, the diamond is 45.52 carats and surrounded by 16 white diamonds. And its current home? The Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History. It's just gorgeous. Wow, what a history. So, tell me, where does the curse come in? (laughs) Well, apparently, the curse itself foretold bad luck and death to not just the owner but anybody who touched it. Oh my gosh, so what happened? Well, some people connected the beheading of Marie Antoinette and King Louis XIV with the diamonds curse. So Ah. kind of started there. Then Wilhelm Falls, the Dutch jeweler who was responsible for cutting the 115 carat diamond to the 45 carat Blue Hope diamond was a victim after handling the stone. His son allegedly stole the diamond, murdered his dad, and then took his own life. Yikes. I know, not good vibes there either. But one of the most notable victims was Evelyn Walsh McLean. She was a rich heiress and owner of the Washington Post, and she bought the Hope Diamond from Pierre Cartier in 1912. After bringing the cursed diamond into her home, she suffered a long list of tragedies. Her mother-in-law died, then her son died at the age of nine, then her husband left her for another woman, but he died in a psychiatric hospital, then her daughter died of a drug overdose, Evelyn, after all this tragedy, she eventually had to sell her newspaper and she died a debtor. Evelyn's surviving children sold the diamond off to a jeweler in 1949 who then donated it to the Smithsonian. 
But get this, Walker. What? The mailman who delivered it to the Smithsonian had a truck accident and suffered a head injury shortly afterward. Okay, that does seem like a long list of sad and unfortunate events. Mm -hmm. But they're all things that can just happen in life, right? True, true. It's unfortunate that she didn't have access to WikiHow, though. WikiHow? <laughs> Why is that, Walker? <laughs> well, for four effective ways to reverse a curse or a spell. Of course. <laughs> so this site suggests that you can do the following to break a curse. Take a salt bath with about a cup of sea salt. Visualize positive energy flowing into the bath and covering you and cleansing you of the curse. Before you even get into the water, Harris, you're supposed to keep your eyes closed with your hands in a praying position, say a purification spell over the water, requesting for the removal of the negative energy. Okay, so can you give me an example of that, Walker? Okay, they suggest something like, salt and water make me pure, bring me now the perfect cure, let the water make me free, as I will so mote it be. Oh, wow, well said. <laughs> okay, and then what? Well, then you just chill. I'm good at that part. Yeah, me too. Definitely <laughs> me too. So what if you have no bathtub? Well, you could cleanse your energy, apparently, by visualizing white light, surrounding your body, smudge using sage or use crystals. Okay. Yeah. Or if you don't have those things handy, you can cast a simple candle spell. You'll need water, a candle, salt, and a bowl. Put the candle in the bowl, Harris, and then you say something like, earth, fire, water, and air, be the answer to my prayer. Banish this curse and leave me pure. Tonight, I claim a blessed cure. Wow, the power <laughs> of words, Walker. <laughs> I know, right? Then you have to break the candle, bury it outside. But the creepiest method, Harris, listen to this, making a mirror box. What's a mirror box? Well, you make a little box with a mirror inside, and then you put a little effigy or doll of the person who cursed you inside. Ooh. I know. This method even calls for some of the person's hair or something that belongs to them. Ick! How are you supposed to get the person's hair? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm now sort of thinking back to like Scooby-Doo again. Exactly! <laughs> Voodoo dolls. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then you're supposed to listen to this. Then you're supposed to burn a black candle on top, speak some magic words to send the curse back to them. Okay. So you reverse it. Okay. So the words again. <laughs> that kind of reminds me of the curse surrounding Shakespeare's Macbeth. Oh, Have you heard of yeah, that? yeah, yeah, yeah. So apparently in theatrical circles, you cannot speak the play's title, any quotes from it, and it should never be spoken in a theater save during a rehearsal or performance of the actual play. Well, as the old bard himself said, mind your speech a little, lest you should mar your fortunes. Thank you for joining us at At Home and Abroad with your host, Harrison Walker. If you enjoyed this episode, you would be a real gem if you would rate and review our show. It helps us to grow and expand our reach. You can also subscribe to follow us each week as we continue the conversation. Find us on Instagram at, at Harrison Walker or visit us at www.harrisonwalker.com. We have great merch, just saying. And of course, we would love to hear from you. <laughs>